one pig because there are more than 2,000. So they had to share a pig. Jesus gave them permission to possess animals. That's even more disturbing. Because animals can be demonized. Just think, just think about your cat being demonized. Man, or your dog, or you know, some wild animal uh, outside. That would be really scary. Some of those movies, I think, they have no idea what they're dealing with, and it could literally be true. And so if you're watching a, a movie or a TV show that has those kinds of things in it, just imagine okay, that that is a real possibility and does happen. So Jesus allows the demons to go into the pigs and right here we have to realize the Lord's priorities. Okay. He knew what was going to happen. He knew what was about to happen but he allowed it anyway. He said, okay, you can go into the pigs. What did, what did Jesus think was going to happen? What did he know was going to happen? He knew that when he went, when the demons went into the pigs, that the pigs would be dead. Okay? 2,000 pigs. Let's say $700 to $1,000 per piece. Okay? If it was $1,000, you know, they slice it up and all that stuff. And even if it was half of that, let's just use round numbers and say $1,000, and then cut it in half later. $1,000 per pig, $2,000 is, I mean, 2,000 pigs is $2 million. Two million dollars worth of pigs he just destroyed. If I were in that town, I would chase Jesus out too, because he's bad for the economy. <laughs> but what was his priority? His priority was not pigs. His priority was a person. And Jesus demonstrates that his priority is people over pigs. Those tending the pigs, the shepherds of pigs, not shepherds of sheep. I don't know what you call pig herders. I don't know if they have a special name. So we'll just call them tenders, pig tenders. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and, and of course they had to report it to their boss. Uh, we just lost all 2,000 of your pigs. What, you irresponsible, what? Came over, people went out to see what happened. They, when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, sitting there, dressed, remember he was naked, dressed and in his right mind and they were afraid something happened this man and, and we have to understand this this man who was demonized now is sane is clothed and now he was able to communicate as a real person and then it says and they were afraid now this afraid thing was the same kind of response that the apostles had when Jesus calmed the wave and the wind. In other words, rather than fearing the weather, they now fear Jesus, who controlled the weather. Rather than fearing the demons, they now fear Jesus because he was the one who controlled the demons. Looks like everybody's afraid of Jesus. The apostles are afraid of Jesus. The demons are afraid of Jesus. Now the people are afraid of Jesus. Everybody's afraid of Jesus. And let me tell you, that is the appropriate response when we get to know Jesus. There should be a part of us who's, uh, part of us that says, eh, Jesus is unpredictable. 
I mean, I don't even know who he is. He could destroy me, just like the demons. Did you come to torture us before it's time? And then in verse 16, those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man. Of course, now they get an eyewitness account. They know exactly what happened. And the pigs. Then the people began to plead with Jesus, leave, please leave, because we can't take this. We can't take you. We can't take you because of, of your unpredictability. And we can't take you because you ruin our economy. You have a different set of priorities than we do. So would you go do your thing somewhere else? What a problem. And as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon possessed begged to go with him. Of course, he had nowhere to go. He was totally rejected. And probably still would have been rejected even with his sanity back. You know, I have no idea what you are capable of, and I don't know when the demons will return and do the same thing, so please. His family, his relatives, his neighbors, his townspeople, all probably want him out of their lives. But, he wants to go with Jesus. Of course he wants to go with Jesus. He's the one, Jesus is the one who healed him, right there. But Jesus didn't let him go. With him, that is. Instead, he says, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how much he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Wow. This demon-possessed man who was being obedient to demons, now is being obedient to Jesus. While the demons were inside of his body, what was he doing? The bidding of the demons. He was being obedient to demons. Now that he is free, he is being obedient to Jesus. That is a picture of our lives. Our lives is, we were enslaved to sin, and then Jesus comes and rescues us, and now we are in, enslaved to Jesus. Because He rescued us, we are being obedient, or we should be obedient to Jesus. And all the people were amazed. Let me emphasize a few things in terms of the response. It's amazing that Jesus would, would do it in this way to demonstrate the priority that he has of people over animals, or people over pigs. So, in response to this, in what Jesus did, our, our response to what is going on here is, praise for Jesus, for the kind of compassion and the priority that he has. In other words, he cares about one person over the life, livelihood of whether it be individual or individuals. He is worth more than a million dollars. And we don't know, you know, the number of pigs that he would have allowed if there were 5,000 or whatever. No matter how many pigs were there, Jesus would have saved the man over the animals. And you know, it's really rude for Jesus to do this because after Jesus sends the demons into the pigs and the pigs die, he never apologizes to the owners of the pigs. You know, I'm sorry, but I had to do this. This man was demonized and the only way that I could get him out was to allow them to enter into your merchandise and sorry that you lost 2,000 pigs. I know it took a long time to accumulate them. You have to start again, but that's just the way it is. Jesus never apologized to him. I bet you the guy who owned the pigs is still holding a grudge. 
You lost all my pigs. I couldn't do that. He wasn't thinking about the person. I don't think he said, oh, praise God, the man is set free. We have, you know, our neighbor back. Now put yourself in the owner's shoes. Would you give up your million dollar house for a person who is a total stranger? Would you give up your million dollar business for a total stranger? Think about that. But Jesus did it for him. And if you were the demonized person, he would do it for you. So look at it from the person's point of view, not the possession point of view. And you will praise Jesus too. <coughs> Secondly, we have to respond to Jesus with awe. Remember the apostles were definitely afraid, the disciples in the boat. Afraid of Jesus once they found out that he is capable of controlling the weather. Well, he's capable of controlling a legion of demons. As a matter of fact, let's look at this for a second. What is motivating the demons to obey Jesus? I mean, if, if you're a rebellious teenager or a rebellious child or son or a daughter in your parents' house, and, and dad says, you got to do this or else. And then you ask, or else what? I'll kick you out. If that's the worst thing it, that, that could happen, so what? Go ahead, kick me out. So if the parents kick you out, if the dad kicks you out, you know, that's it. You still don't have to obey if you have a rebellious heart, right? Because you can try to go fend for yourself. Okay? What if dad says, well, I'm going to call the police and have you arrested if you don't leave. That's the worst thing that can happen. Sure, go ahead. I'm still not going to do what you tell me to do. So, the police come, arrest him. You know, he's 18. He goes to jail. Okay? If that's the worst thing that can happen, do I still need to obey Dad? No. So here, when Jesus tells the demons, hey, get out, what's the worst thing that can happen? <coughs> says, if you don't get out right now, I'm going to throw you directly into the lake of fire. Do not pass go. Do not collect two hundred. You're just going straight to jail. That's it. If he, did, if he said that, of course they would go straight now. Okay, let me delay this a little longer. I'll do whatever you say and go into the pigs. What were they concerned about? They were concerned about his power. So much so that when they said go into the pigs, they went. What's motivating them to obey Jesus? Fear. Fear. Now, we should never obey Jesus out of fear. I mean, we should obey Jesus, but we shouldn't obey Jesus out of fear. People who obey Jesus out of fear don't have a relationship with him. People obey Jesus because they want to obey Jesus because what Jesus did for them. How he has offered his body as a, live, uh, as a dead sacrifice to offer forgiveness for humanity, including themselves. So I don't obey Jesus because you know, I'm afraid that he's going to torture me. I obey Jesus because he loved me and demonstrated that. And he demonstrated his power to do that. And so when he confronts the demons, they obey because he has power to do exactly what he claims and intends to do eventually. They said, did you come to torture us? Right? Torture me. But the other passages says, torture me or torture us before it's time. They know they're going to be destroyed, but if they don't obey, they're going to go straight. There's no delay. So, the reason why they're obeying is because Jesus had the command to send them to the lake of fire immediately. And 
and they don't want to go immediately. Third thing is to praise Jesus for his guidance. Jesus instructs the man how to live afterwards. Now, demons have been cast out. He is so grateful, he says, Jesus, I want to follow you. It's a strange thing that Jesus does, and that is to say no. He says, no, don't. You, you are not called to full-time ministry. The disciples were called to full-time ministry, and that's why they're following it 24-7 for three and a half some years. But for this man, he says, you are not called to full-time ministry. This is what you need to do. What you need to do is you need to tell your story to everybody. You need to testify concerning my work in your life. And this is what we need to do. I'm going to exhort you, and we already talked about this among the leadership, I'm going to exhort you to share your testimony. Testimony, not just of conversion, but the work of God in your life, which means there should be an endless number of testimonies. Right? So, I requested Elder Hung do some finagling and rearranging of the service so that we would have testimonies. And for you, get ready by e either writing them down or practicing it. Because you don't want to stand up there and ramble. And the more you are practicing that in your small groups, in your Bible studies, everywhere else, the better. Because you can be very concise, get to the point, and then we can praise the Lord in response. So share your testimony. He was healed by a demon. He has the marks to show that he was possessed. He had the hair cut, or the lack thereof, to demonstrate. Everybody knows what he looks like nude. Please. But when he shared his testimony, everybody was amazed. At what? Him? No. He was totally helpless to do anything. Now he is saved and he is glorifying Jesus, who had the power to cast down a legion of demons, or cast out a legion of demons from his body. I want to know if God has cast out a demon from you. I want to know if God has changed your life in one way or another. I want to know if God has worked in your life in such a way as to bring you closer to Him. These are your testimonies. And we want you to share them with all of us, not just keep it to yourself. Because you need to glorify God in the work that He has done in your life and in my life. That way we can all praise the Lord and be amazed together at what God is doing. You can not only do that for this man, that he could do that for you and your spirit. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your Son to rescue us. And Lord Jesus, thank you for prioritizing and showing us that humanity matters more than animals. And if we had to make a choice, humanity wins every time. Let humanity always win. And let humanity bring glory to you by recognizing that it's a gift, it is by grace, and that you have demonstrated it, not just in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, but in our lives also. Help us to share that so that we may all be encouraged together and that we may all worship you together for it. May your work in our lives be exemplified and proclaimed. We pray in Jesus' name.